Good morning. A very warm welcome to everyone to the seventh session of the lecture series uh, Architecture of Territory. We are uh, looking at territorial design questions from various perspectives, uh, um, various perspectives of, of theory, of, uh, of uh, uh, philosophy, of urban studies, and we are hoping to contribute to territorial design. Um, the, I am, um, we are addressing you from uh, the ON Auditorium. I hear a bit of uh, uh, sound interference. Uh, I believe we, we are around uh, 20 here, and I, I see that students are gathering also in the Zoom Auditorium right now around 60 people. So we are in a nice group of around 80 at this moment and probably will be a little bit more in the, in the minutes to come. So uh, thank you for uh, joining and thank you to the team this morning, Dr. Nasli Tumerdam, as uh, every time in this lecture series, uh, Michael Gieben uh, on, um, the technical uh, aspects, the filming, <laughs> and uh, let's say the difficult tasks of this uh, hybrid classroom, and uh, Vesna Jovanovic also uh, interacting with you uh, in the in the chat and and helping uh, answer answer your questions. So uh, we are delighted uh, this morning to have with us Dr. Uh, Florian Köchlin, Swiss author, biologist and chemist, and the prominent voice in the field of bioethics. We uh, uh, basically got to know her through, no, got to know her work through the press. Uh, it was uh, uh, highly um, intriguing and, and fantastic and inspiring. We absolutely are delighted to have her here. So she will be introduced in a moment and uh, she will be our third guest in the framework of the series uh, on my species. Uh, I will ask uh, Nasle to, to remind you how we have curated my species and to introduce uh, Florian Kochlin. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone again. So uh, our team, my species, the non-human, the more than human and the other than human. Today, we are becoming ever more aware of the manifold entanglements of plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and as we all know so well, also viruses. What, can we, what we can refer to as the multi-species turn poses a possibility to fracture the anthropocentric perspective that assumes human superiority over any other living being and non-living entity and allows us to question the dualistic ontologies of human and animal, nature and culture, city and territory, and so on. Within the team, my species, the four guest speakers, Fei Fei Jo, Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, Florian Kerlin, and Oksana Timofeva engaged in the fields ranging from art and landscape representation to bioethics and environmental philosophy, will approach territory through the notions such as multi-species coexistence and diversity. With a more than human perspective, on the territory, the guest speakers will elaborate their take on telling horrible stories in beautiful ways, expand upon mankind's fascination to better the world, debate the dignity of plants and confer the non-human turn and what is to come after. So today our guest speaker, uh, third guest speaker, Florian Kohlin, will, uh, with her talk, Tomatoes Talk, Birch Trees Learn, Do Plants Have Dignity? is actually uh, the first per, uh, guest who is in person here uh, in our lecture hall. And we are very pleased to welcome her uh, and have her here. Uh, she was born in 1948. She is a Swiss biologist and a chemist. In the 1980s, she played a key role in the protest against the plant construction of the Kaiser Ox nuclear power plant and was one of the founding members of the Basel Appeal against genetic engineering. In 1995, she played a leading role in founding Genet, 
a Europe-wide network of NGOs critical of genetic engineering. In January 1999, she founded the Blue Ridge Institute, which deals with the critical assessment of genetic engineering projects and developments. She remains as the managing director to this day. Florian Kerlin explores new scientific findings about plants and other living beings, particularly communication between uh, plants and their use of networks and new concepts for agriculture and research strategies for this purpose. She sees her task in the translation of expert knowledge into concepts that are easily understood by the general public. She is also a nonfiction author, and you may see some of her books here, dealing with subjects of genetic engineering, epigenetics, plant communication, and the ethical implications of modern biology. And she also paints, which maybe will be also more obvious in our uh, introduction of the exercise. Uh, so Florian also selected the concepts for the warm-up game and, uh, okay, so uh, here is one of her wonderful books. Uh, <laughs> it's also in our library and there are even more. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nazli. And thanks, uh, Florian, for these uh, fabulous uh, copies. We will, uh, we will uh, enjoy them uh, soon uh, with students. And uh, now the game, uh, very uh, interesting and exciting. Um, the first uh, concept on the, on the table is plant dignity, uh, followed by plant relationships. Um, great uh, challenge for your morning warm up, whether you are uh, <laughs> comfortably in your rooms or here in the auditorium, uh, we suggest that um, those of you with last names beginning A to N can engage with the plant dignity and M to Z with plant relationships. So to have a kind of a half-half mix um, with your contributions. We have a couple of minutes and uh, Florian, uh, since you have, um, uh, we have of course asked you to select the concepts and uh, if you like, uh, you can already join here and perhaps um, comment, uh, say a few words on the concepts to, to um, um, to, to help the students maybe in their uh, sketches. No, I won't help. I mean, it's okay. them now, not me. Florian is next to me and she said she, she, she doesn't want to help. She wants to see how, what you will come up with. So that's, that's perfect. So I can just report that we have right now 89 people in the Zoom auditorium and another uh, maybe 20 uh, in the in the ONA. So we are a little bit over a hundred, very nice group this morning. Um, it would be actually a good moment uh, if you like to, to turn on your cameras and you can at least see each other in the act of sketching <laughs> in these little little boxes. Okay, well, that's great. We, we can uh, now enjoy for a moment looking, uh, looking at you and um, seeing all of you out there. Okay, we are uh, we are having uh, the beginning of uh, of your uh, instant exhibition in uh, on the screen right now on the large uh, screen in the auditorium, and uh, and on on for your suggestion, and I think it's a really good idea. We will we will just look without. <laughs> without commenting. <laughs> I 
But I can tell you that Florian has a big smile on her face right now. A very brave contribution on plan dignity. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. So uh, thank you for uh, these moments of um, uh, silence and enjoyment of, uh, of, uh, of the drawings. Um, I found it um, exciting. The, the more interesting the concepts, the more interesting the contributions, more diverse, more surprising. So uh, now, now is the moment to, to welcome uh, Florian. Uh, for for her talk 
please, uh, please come forward and see your microphone is on. That's not the right thing. <laughs> well, okay. Is it not the right? That's, it's okay. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you for thank being you very with much. us. <laughs> well, thank you for the drawings. I think many of them I could have used in my lecture too. I will, uh, I will think of it. This picture is a Swiss stone pine. Not a very good picture. I took it uh, this summer while I was hiking in the national park in the Val Tupchun. And the guide told us that this tree is about 500, oops, I have to stand here, 500 to 600 years old, 500 to 600 years. When this pine was a little tree, uh, Christopher Columbus didn't land in America yet. 600 years, 500 years, a lot of upheaval, but think of what this pine experienced tempests and colds and heat waves and avalanches and all sorts of droughts and millions of ever-changing uh, generations of bacteria, viruses, caterpillars, worms, other insects trying to feed, to feed on this uh, pine tree and damage it does. But it still stands there. For, uh, for me, an absolute miracle. And you know, because trees can't just run away like we do when there is a danger. So today, more and more scientists believe that this is only possible because trees and plants have a, a huge capacity to communicate and to build networks. And of that, I will talk first. Um, not of this Swiss stone pine, because there we don't know much. You know the smells when, you, when you're hiking in the woods, these beautiful smells. That's not for us. That's for communicating among each other and among insects. I'll switch to another plant, a maize plant. Uh, I visited some, uh, some years ago, Ted Turlings at the University of Neuchâtel. They are experiencing with this. It's a maize blade and a caterpillar, and you see a parasitic wasp coming and damaging this, um, this caterpillar. The question was, how does this wasp know so fast that there is a juicy caterpillar to feed on? That's what the group experienced and uh, uh, experimented on, and they uh, slit the leaf nothing happened. They put the caterpillar on him and the little wasp came. And uh, they, also, uh, they also found out that the maize then produces uh, fragrances that attracts the, the wasp. Then they were questioning, yeah, what on the caterpillar, what is really attracting uh, the wasp? and they uh, smeared feces on the leaf, nothing happened. They smeared spit on the leaf and tuck, the little wasp came. So they um, made experiments for about four years. They fed caterpillars, they brought them to vomit, they smeared the spit on the leaf, they analyzed this and they came after four years, they came to a compound they called volicitin that the plant tastes, interprets, produces a fragrance that attracts the little wasp. And then when the caterpillar feeds, it's making little holes and spit is trickling through the holes. And that's what the maize leaf can detect. And the most amazing thing for me is that the maize not only knows that it is attacked, but by whom. If a maize plant is attacked by spider mites, it produces a slightly different scent, attracting predatory mice who feed on, on the spider mice. So the, the uh, maize plant uh, tastes on the spit of the insect, who it is, produces a fragrance to attract the right bodyguard. Isn't that fantastic? And underground, they're doing the same thing that's also the uh, group around Ted Turlings. They found out that when um, I have to speak, uh, the um, corn root worm 
uh, attacks the roots. They the maize plants produce the fragrance that attack little nematodes, that's little worms uh, who feed on them. So our maize plant, um, first of all, it, it warns the neighbors uh, attention attacking and neighbors also can start to defend themselves. They produce um, scent according to the insect who is feeding on them, be, be uh, over the ground and below ground. Um, tomato plants can do that too. And uh, tomato plants, yeah, they are well, I just have to tell a little story. They're well examined too. And when the tomato plant is attacked, it also produces a scent which warns the other leaves of the plant and also the neighbor's attention. And the scientists know this fragrance is a mixture of methyl jasmonates and methyl jasmonates are ve very well known in the perfume industry. So when um, they did these experiments, the female researchers, the female researchers were told not to carry, not to wear Chanel 5 because it would have uh, diffused the, the tomatoes. For the tomato, it means, ah, oh, it's a danger. And for us, it might be a beautiful smell. Okay. All plants communicate with uh, different fragrances. Up to now, about 2,000 fragrances are known. Little mixtures are a little different and plants warn each other, they uh, call, they call a beneficial insects, they send out SOS signals, they repel other insects, and they even coordinate their behavior. Now you might ask, how does a plant smell? Or how does a plant um, know who is coming? Taste or smell, and of course a plant doesn't have a nose and not eyes, you know that light is important, but the plant has these, uh, you call it uh, receptors, sensitory cells all over the plant. So the plant as a whole smells, the plant as a whole sees, the plant as a whole um, tastes. And so we know now that plants, also our Swiss stone pine, they can very sophisticatedly experience their surroundings. And we have noticed they can smell, they can taste, light is important, can they even hear? If I would have said that 10 or 15 years ago, everybody said, well, she's crazy, esoteric or whatever. I made a, a Skype interview with a um, Australian researcher with Monica Galliano, and she made this experiment. She had a plastic, a plastic tube in the form of the Y on the head. She filled the tube with earth and she planted some pea seedlings on the top. And in the first experiment, she moistened, dampened one side and as expected, all roots grew to the damp side. And the second experiment, the, the earth was completely dry, not a drop of water. And she coiled a tube of water around the second uh, leg and she let uh, rush water through and all the, all the roots grew to the rush of water. So plants can hear the rushing of water. Today, there is even a whole section in science called plant acoustics. And I can you tell you perhaps one more experiment that's already some two or three years ago by Heidi Apple. She is now, I think, at the University of Toronto. They, she and our team, they recorded, they recorded the noise of an eating caterpillar. I imagine it's like that, but probably it isn't. So. <laughs> then they played this, this noise to a plant, to Arabidopsis, that's kind of the, um, how shall I say, laboratory mouse of the uh, plant biologists. And the plant began to defend itself, to, to uh, activate its, its 
uh, defense genes and defense enzymes. So afterwards, they thought, well, perhaps it's all, only the noise. They took, they recorded the noise of a wind, not a frequency, nothing happened. And then they were interested, well, perhaps it's, uh, it's just this noise, whatever it is. And then they recorded, you have to come to this idea, the love song of grasshoppers. And they played it to the plant and nothing happened. And I imagine, it's certainly not true, but I imagine it goes like that. If a caterpillar munches, it's like, and the love song of a grasshopper is something like that. And why the plant recognizes the noise of a chewing caterpillar and how they do it, we don't know. We really don't know. So, but that shows me that plants can really very sophisticatedly uh, look at, well, uh, perceive the surroundings and then react respondently. We'll coming to that. Now let's go underground. We had a few pictures better than I could do it from your, your uh, drawings. First, look at this, it's a forest, individual trees, a pine, a beach, a berg, and the yellow spots should be uh, mushrooms or fungi. If you look at the whole thing, and that's what we always saw in your drawings, better than here, is that underneath there is a complex dynamic net, a net from uh, roots from the trees and the mycelium of the, of the fungi, and that's called mycorrhiza net. Mycorrhiza means in Greek uh, symbiosis from, from mushroom and roots. Actually, this is not a right, uh, right picture. It should be the trees above, very small, and then the whole complex net, even as, as big as above or even bigger. And it's really very dynamic and most vital for the, for the wood. Like um, the, the trees are giving sugar compounds from photosynthesis into the net and the mycelium are giving nutrients like nitrogen or phosphate and even water to the net. It's a give and take. Um, a researcher in Basel, Verena Wimken, told me if a beach isn't on the net, it grows about that big, that big. It's completely fundamentally dependent on this on this net, giving it everything. And most, in, most interesting also that researchers in recent years, they found out that the trees um, exchange nutrients, water, uh, carbohydrates, warning signals through this net among themselves. Perhaps just one experiment, experiment done by Susan Zimmert from Canada. It should be, these two should be much farther apart. It's on the one, one side, it's a birch tree, on the other side, a Douglas fir. They are not related at all. She put uh, plastic bags over them so they couldn't correspond through the air. And they were really far apart, so the roots couldn't touch, but only the mycelium. And she injected radio radioactive uh, CO2 into one bag. And she hoped that this CO2 would be taken up by the plant in photosynthesis and that she produces, that the plant produces uh, sugar compounds. And after a while, she went with a Geiger counter and it really made beep, beep, beep. And she went to the Douglas fir and there it also made beep, beep, beep. So the radioactively marked sugar compounds went into the mycelium under the earth and the Douglas fir took it up. So there is this exchange and one also of, of um, information and one researcher called it the internet, the below ground internet. Some of you 
your drawings were showing that also very beautifully. But it's not always nice down there. Also, while hiking this summer, I found this little plant. It's called in English spruce asparagus, the Fichtenspargel. You see it's white. It's only about 10 centimeters. It's white, meaning it can't do any photosynthesis. And this Fichtenspargel, they introduced into the uh, mycelium and they steal they really steal carbohydrates and nu nutrients from this net. So it's always cooperation and uh, conquer and debate among them, but it's this huge net. Also, outside the woods, you find this. Um, that's studies, uh, experiments done in Basel by Andreas Wiemken. If you look at it, they, they uh, grew here the mycelium uh, threads. You see young carrot roots. And if you look really carefully, you see these thin threads, that's mycelium. And they examined it and they believe today that when you uh, have a good mixed culture, like in old times and many countries it was done, it's something like a, a dynamic underground marketplace a give and take where plants with long roots can give water. If they have too much water, they give water into this uh, bazaar or underground marketplace. Plants who can uh, acquire nitrogen, give nitrogen. Plants with especially good photosynthesis, hydrocarbons and so on. So it's a bazaar where everybody is helping everybody. And there is also concurrence, of course. It's both, but uh, it's it's all connected in a in, in a way we they told me in, that researchers told me in a way we still can't really imagine to what extent. So I go a step for well perhaps this while when I know that and I, when I'm going walking in the woods. And I know above me, there is a whispering and murmuring, a whispering and murmuring of sense. I just can't understand. And below ground, under my feet, there is an exchange of nutrients and in information I can't see. It gives me a completely different feeling. It's not me here and tree there and tree there, all isolated but it's all being connected and myself too. Normally I get this feeling while drawing or painting, but knowing this from science gives me this feeling too. And I think when you're dealing with a tree, for example, you're not only dealing with the tree, you're dealing with the microbiome in the roots, you're dealing with earth, you're dealing with worms, you're dealing with millions of microbes and other animals down there. You're dealing with butterflies, you're dealing with uh, bees, you're dealing with birds, you're dealing with other plants. So every tree, every plant is some kind of a, some kind of a micro ecosystem. And I think that's really important to realize that. I talked to some, uh, was this Landschaftsarchitekt, uh, architect of, for, for gardeners. And for them, it's mostly just we take a tree to the city to ameliorate the climate, but it's much, much more because we are part of it. So I can say the plant is communication. A plant is relationship. Perhaps, but that's only perhaps even more than we, for us, because a plant can't run away, a plant has to stay like, like our Swiss stone pine in place for 500 or 600 years. And without this communication and networking, that wouldn't be possible. I go a step further. Uh, researchers even claim that plants can learn. Now, learn is a fuzzy concept. 
and we don't even know the molecular by, uh, base for, for human learning. It's still kind of, we just don't know it. And also, if, you, if I would have said plants learned some years ago, it would be completely confused. But you can define learning. I do it as a, a biologist, a well-known biologist, Richard Carbon, said from the University of California, he wrote many books on that. Learning occurs when living beings remember past experiences and then change their behavior accordingly. That's just one kind of learning, could be a definition. Well, if that is definition, plants can do that. A very simple, a very simple experiment done in the USA, they raised tom tomato plants over eight generations in a greenhouse without any bug on it. They put a bug on it and the plant slowly uh, activated the defense genes and enzymes to defend this, uh, this, uh, this caterpillar or bug. Well, it didn't fall dead like I grow, but still it could defend himself. The second time, a week later, it was much faster and much more efficient. So the tomato plant remembered the past experience and could activate its uh, defense enzymes and genes much faster the second time. Probably all plants can do that. They did the experiment with other plants and found the same uh, result. And in a study done in Finland, I found that birch trees even remember past events for as long as four years and could defend themselves after four years much better uh, against an enemy. Well, all these amazing capacities of plants, I myself can only explain on the basis of evolution. We are related to plants. If you look at the beginning of living being, oh, here I got a German slide, sorry about that. There was three billion years of evolution of one cell organisms in the uh, in this in the ur soup in the primordial soup i think it is in english there was lots lots of evolution in this time all the co cell intern communication system all the relating capacities all the metabolisms uh, evolved in this time and it's probably not the strongest cell that could survive but the one most pliable and the one who could coordinate with others and then 300 to 400 million years evolution of plants and animals, that's peanuts compared to the 3 billion years one cell. So we are actually, we are related to plants. And the point is that both animals and plants are very, um, can adapt very fast and flexible to an environment that always changes. Um, we through running and eating and climbing a tree and so on, and plant through growth and development. Both of them, of course, through communication and, and uh, network building. But the growth and development, and I want to show one a very simple example. Uh, Dan, Dan the lion in my garden on the path, tough and very small, I can tramp on it, nothing happens, it survives. Just beside, in the shade, it's like that juicy green and smelling, probably from the same parents. A mouse, a cat can eat a mouse, can chase a mouse and eat a mouse. But when the cat doesn't get food, it can't grow the size of a mouse only but the plant can chase them out. So it's just a completely different strategy to adopt to, a ever -changing, uh, to an ever-changing environment. And that makes, that makes plants so successful. Uh, let's come back what that all means, what that means for us or for the, um, 
a Swiss stone pine. Um, perhaps that much up to now, plants and still in science are looked at as some kind of, how shall I say, um, living automatons reacting only on their genetic program, reacting on the laws of actio reactio, being passive, still are looked like that, like kind of isolated in the earth from below water, from above CO2 for photosynthesis. But now we see the plants communicate, uh, connect, make networking, smell, hear, learn, remember. And that turns the picture of the plant completely upside down. That's my main point. So what are the consequences of this? I mean, um, plants are still looked at as some kind of soulless machines like animals perhaps some 50 years ago but now we know animals escape this mechanistic trap and we know an animal is not a soulless machine an animal has dignity and plants we are miles away from this point why i don't know the answer anymore well dignity is a funny word and i had ample opportunity you saw it already to discuss this uh, intensively in the national ethics committee i was member at that time and because i have to say as a swiss i'm kind of proud the swiss constitution is the only constitution worldwide that had uh, this paragraph the confederation confederation shall take account of the dignity of living beings, Article 120. But what does that mean? So the Swiss government came to the ethics committee and asked, well, people, what does it mean? Well, they said it a little more polite, but still. We discussed it for four years because it's a, a tricky question. Dignity could mean that a plant has a value of her or itself, independent of human interests, independent of if we eat this plant or, or find it nice or whatever. Um, if we look at plants as living automatons, as simple things, then dignity of plant would be an abs uh, absurd concept. It wouldn't make sense at all. If instead we consider plants as living beings, perhaps even capable of subjective perceptions, we don't know, and of sentience, we don't know. Having a life for themselves, independent of what we want, then we can state plants have a dignity. We had long discussions and decision trees, you don't have to read them. And after four years, it was very, because it was the first time worldwide, we couldn't invite some, somebody who told us what to do. And we never were of one opinion. But at the end, it was clear, we can, you can violate the uh, dignity of a plant. But what that means wasn't clear at all. Some thought if you go on the way and you purposefully uh, kill a plant on the way, a uh, dandelion on the way, that's uh, against the dignity. For me, it was the massive monoculture, the massive industrialization of plants where plants weren't looked at as living beings anymore. Okay, so we had the press conference and that was already 2008. I re realized this morning. And uh, there were some really nice perception but you really could laugh at it, of course. Uh, the Betzeichle, that's a Swiss plant. Well, shall I translate it or you'll see it? And the Cri de la Salade, and in the Basel Zeitung, it was, da, da blieb wohl der gesunde Menschenverstand auf der Strecke. It would be weird, uh, the, the dignity of the Danilayen and so on. And in the French, Epto, this one I love too, Swiss 
la science menacée par la dignité des plantes. Adam and Eva and he uh, the, the Baptist. You can make fun of it really well. And a few months afterwards, um, the Swiss Ethics Committee even got the IG Nobel Prize. IG means ignoble. So it's a Nobel Prize for specially ridiculous and laughable research where people laugh at and perhaps later on think about it. So a member of our uh, committee went to Harvard to get this Nobel Prize. Yeah, after that, I was still not very uh, contentious. So it was a very general approach, but what, what does it really mean for the plant? So I gathered a group, also we were uh, friends and uh, uh, farmers and a gardener and a molecular biologist and a botanist and an activist and we discussed it also for a few years we tried to approach very carefully uh, the plants from different parts and tried to deduce is it possible to give plants rights a, a very special question the word right comes from the Greek, and the Greek gave rights to white men, of course not to slaves, and not, of course not to women, and not even animals or whatever. And that changed slow but slow, and now even animals have rights. Plants? And how do you, how do you um, get at that? We, we put up this um, Rhino Rhin, thesis on the rights of plants, and it's, it's just some kind of a guidepost. For example, the right not to be patented like a mi micro oven or a chemical uh, substance, or the right to some degree of freedom regarding propagation and adaptation. So it's a proposition to go on with this discussion. And I think it's a very important discussion but because for my feeling, they have to be some kind of limits against the total industrialization of plants. And we have to have some kind of responsibility toward plants. And of course, it doesn't mean we shouldn't eat or cut or graft or, or whatever plants. Giving animals dignity didn't mean we take them out of the food chain. And it's very difficult to, to know when, when the border is crossed. I mean, a salad doesn't cry if, when we uh, misshape him. But dignity of, of animals and rights of animals were only discovered when we, discovered, when we looked at the, at the animals in, in, the, in nature. In the laboratorium, they behave differently. And the, the experiments I told you now about most were in nature. And perhaps that's a way. It's a, a discussion that goes on and on. And we are at the very beginning. And that's in my garden. And how, uh, for the last minute, I want to give the stage to the plant. How am I doing it? It's a hübsches Filmli. Ah, yes. It's from Arte Nova. And just to give the stage to the plant.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Florian. I uh, have to come uh, uh, close to you uh, because ah, okay. we are in the, in the okay. hybrid auditorium. <laughs> And uh, I, uh, I am also really, really moved uh, by this uh, clarity of your message and uh, the way how you put it across. I, I hope we, I hope that uh, you are right that uh, that animal rights are fought to to a sufficient degree. And I, I certainly am... not sufficient degree, <laughs> but it's accepted that animals should have rights. But we could do much, much, much more. That's not the question. Absolutely, and I uh, I am also I am also really excited about uh, about the, the the kind of clarity of that message that you that you gave us, which is uh, there has to be a limit to industrialization and and monoculture of uh, of a plant life, and that's certainly uh, a kind of environment that we see around us that we could do much more about as yeah. as designers um i uh, i can uh, perhaps uh, we, we will uh, have a we will have a bit of uh, time indeed for 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 questions and a conversation while while you are uh, gathering uh, uh your your thoughts and questions for florian uh i would like to ask you would you share with us a few points from that uh, um right now our thesis on the rights of plants because that is <laughs> that is a, a fantastic document that that florian brought for us and and she will also uh send us a digital copy and we will share it with everyone but i i think it would be valuable if you if you give us Oof. a few comments on that i mean i guess to write that was uh, as you described was uh, was a kind of a long process and an interesting yep. challenge well, I don't know if I can do that because I didn't read them this morning and it was 2008 or even no later. And we looked first at the plant and tried to go around the plant like I did today. Then we looked at the relationship between plants, uh, plants and the environment and then the relationship issue between plants and us humans and then from that deduce rights and i think you have to read them for yourself and for me really if you're going to become architectures and designers for me a really important point is that you realize that the plant a tree is a micro ecosystem of relationships and networks and with a with a plant bringing in here you bring in whole micro with all the birds and with all the butterflies with all the worms it's always the whole thing it's not an isolated uh, passive thing you bring in here which might do something for the climate but that's about it i think this message it's also called um, some philosophers call this the plant blindness. And uh, I had a call from a student from uh, this summer. She did her baccalaureate and she said, well, I'm, uh, it's great your books, you know, because we in school, we had plants too. We know about photosynthesis. We know how water comes up, but it was kind of a deadly thing it wasn't a living thing and that's what i call plant blindness and i think most of us still have it us being so separated from the whole rest and i don't have really the words to say that um it's uh, it starts uh, it starts uh, with the with the statement plants are living beings and there are uh, um, so you know it better than me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just reading because I'm fascinated by. It. There are 29 articles uh, that are that are each to say so deduced from from the from the previous, and the document is summarized uh, in a, in a kind of a I think it looks like a, like a little charter, the rights of plants, and there are 
six. So I will read them to you. Reproductive rights, rights to independence, rights to evolution, right to survival as a species, right to respectful research and development. That's incredible. Right not to be patented. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that is that is fascinating. So so there are even just reading reading the titles. I mean, there are uh, we can observe many many areas of of conflict because we, for instance, we are aware of the species extinction due due to due to climate change, for example. No, so this is this is in a in a kind of a direct. Uh, um, Rights to to independence. This is this is related to the monoculture question, for example. Rights to survive. Uh, rights to um, uh, respectful research and development. Well, it for instance, rights to reproduction. I mean, this this uh, uh, um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, um, is uh, is in conflict with with many practices that that are uh, in a in a kind of a general. Uh, use uh, either in in agriculture or or in research. So, but uh, um, perhaps you would you would uh, you would like to tell us a few words on on your uh, work also in the in the field uh, or or against uh, genetic engineers specifically Oof. because uh, you have to stay two days. I, <laughs> I can I of course I can totally imagine, but just give us give us a little taste of that because this is this is super super important and, and exciting. So this is the right not to be patented. Yeah well patents are a really good thing in industrial societies. So a researcher can have some kind of 20 years when he did a lot of research for his machine or, he or her chemical compound to be protected. But patents were never thought to be for plants and animals and living beings. Because to get a patent, you have to describe it completely. So somebody can rebuild it and you have to invent it, not just discover it. And isn't it just the big difference between a living being and a machine that a living being cannot be invented, cannot be completely described, cannot be built like a Lego uh, thing. That's the difference between living beings and, and machines. And there was a huge patent struggle and I was in it since ever beginning. That industry, there is a lot of pressure to put patents on genetic engineered uh, animals and plants. And they used a um, legal trick to define the putting in of a gene, which is a normal as invention. And because they put in the gene, they said the whole animal or the whole plant is patented. Not only the whole animal and the whole plant, but the generations, therefore, for 20 years, as if they had anything invented in that. So patents on, on plants and patent on life um, illuminates exactly this question. What is life? What is a plant? What is an animal? And why can we today industrialize and make plants and animals to object to soulless machine so much? So it's, 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 um, it also has, of course, the, the side that um, it allows a monopoly control over these plants. It, it's a massive concentration of the seed market, thanks to patents. Uh, dependence of the farmers, researchers, because of patents. There was a famous case of Percy Schmeisser. He was a farmer in Canada with a rops with, um, um, I forgot the name. And he had some, some genetically engineered uh, plants in his field. He didn't sow it through wind. And Monsanto put a log case against him because he had patented seeds in his field. And that was a year long struggle. 
So the farmers get completely dependent. They can't take their seed for the next year's, their, their uh, plants for the next year's seed. But that's one side. And for me, the ethical side, that the plant isn't a soulless machine that can be patented. That's the other side. Uh, this is fascinating. So I'm, I'm uh, dying to ask you many questions. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, but I, I will give uh, advantage to, to students who I, I guess uh, are also, uh, uh, also curious right now. So, so let me just try to, to open that chat box. Okay. Now I have to get out of your uh, uh, vision radius, uh, uh, 105 students in Zoom, and I will go to another place in order to read the question. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, okay, I can maybe... Uh, sorry, thanks. So we have a question from... Um, Okay, question is from Manuel uh, Lertz. What conclusions can be drawn on the dignity and rights of, for example, computers and algorithms from these reflections? So, <laughs> okay, great. So we, we have a kind of a broader uh, ethical uh, dilemma regarding the, the artificial intelligence. Um, um, I don't know, I don't think there is an answer to this yet. I just know that artificial intelligence and precision agriculture and smart agriculture is gaining incredibly speed. And um, what that means, I don't know yet. On the one place, it could it could lead to more uh, diversity, to more mixed crops. On the other hand, it leads to much more control to much more being nudged into what industry wants. So that's a difficult question. And I don't want to put it against each other because in my book also I have an interview, an interesting interview with Peter Glor. He is a, a, a artificial intelligence prof at MIT and lives in Baden. And he is doing all kinds of experiments with in, uh, artificial intelligence and plants and uh, could show that, for example, my Moses dance to the yodel of, uh, of his former wife or that plants recognize if you walk happily toward them or sad toward them. They can't distinguish sad and unhappy, but the you your um shit, your your sound of your steps. So. Your steps are different. And the plants can measure the electromagnetic uh, fields and show that. And if you walk happily to them, artificial intelligence makes like that. And if you work sad, it makes like Okay, but it's uh, you can use artificial intelligence to get a little nearer to plants, but I myself am convinced that we never ever can explain plants as a whole because they are not machines, because they have a known interest and they act as as from themselves. So. I don't know if that answers the question, but uh. yeah, I uh, I um, invite uh, Manuel to um, to to continue with the follow up question or to to join because we can. In fact, now we could we could see you uh, guys. So the Zoom auditorium, you are invited now to to switch on your cameras and we can project. Uh, uh, project uh, project you let's say in the in the auditorium and have a, a kind of a, a kind of a let's say semblance of of some uh, embodied conversation which would be very nice I don't know uh, maybe maybe you can help me Michi what do I have to press to get this into a kind of gallery view here okay great so uh, please turn on your cameras guys and we are seeing your faces it's very exciting. 
Uh, Manuel, would you like to follow up with this? I see you over there. Yes, uh, thank you for the, for the comment. Um, I think my question was more related to how we can think about the dignity and the rights of algorithms and maybe artificial intelligences. Not that much about how um, those computers and algorithms um, um, beeinflussen die Pflanzen, sondern mehr darüber, wie die Pflanzen und Algorithmen eigentlich selbstständige Lebewesen sein könnten und als solche Sorry, I, I don't understand it. It's so. Um... It's uh, it's hard. We have a lot of echo, Manuel. Do you do you mind to write it down quickly in the chat box? Because I can't understand it. That's uh, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, we have a we have a, a question from Yesha. Um, we can try uh, Yesha if you if you wanna. Uh, say something about it. I will first read what you have written to us. I hold this idea of plants living closely in the soil, competing for water and nutrients and stealing away from each other. Is this an accurate picture of what is actually going on? Uh, I think this is an interesting question of, uh, of uh, to, to what extent is this a kind of a rootless competition of, of uh, uh, plants uh, uh, together and to what extent is it the collaborative? I, I think it's a very anthropomorphic uh, a kind of a conception. Always, it's always both. Being, being a society of plants means there's cooperation and competition. And I think, well, I read many books on that. And up to now, we have the innerst feeling that it's competition, Darwin, survival of the fittest, are the main force uh, building our society, plants and animals. And we look at symbiosis and cooperation still as kind of a side effect. But now the, there are many researchers saying, well, it's probably the other way around, that symbiosis is what life makes ticker and it needs always both for example that plants can live on dry earth when they came from the water there were one cellular plants they couldn't stay on a rock they couldn't provide themselves with water they had no tubes they couldn't provide themselves with nutrients on the dry earth they didn't know how and it's only the symbiosis between plants and fungi, which could, which were the, the fundamental uh, part that plants could live on land. Same with um, photosynthesis. It's a symbiosis from bacteria and plants. Same with our uh, uh, breathing. It's a symbiosis. So it's always both. And I, I don't want to make this nice picture of plants always being nice and us. It's both. And it, it really fundamentally works together. And it's much more exciting like that, I think, too. <laughs> Great. We are, uh, we are looking for, uh, for more uh, questions. Um, in the oh okay we have uh, okay we have gotten um, also uh, new uh, clarifications from um, uh, Manuel and let me and uh, Yesha I am just trying to uh, to see. Um, Okay, what is updated? So, so first we have a comment from Yesha. Do you think plants have a sense of injustice? For instance, when another plant is parasitic on them, indeed no, a kind no, of I hedera, a I big hedera helix around, uh, I don't know, a birch tree I or something. A, a I know that animals question. have a very strong inclination for injustice and unfairness. 
well, we know it from some or many animals. I think I'm very careful with these with these uh, expressions. It's touching to the question, do plants have sentience? Can plants feel pain? Can plants feel lust? Do plants feel justice and justice? And we just don't know. I'm there. Are, there are people who say they do. I don't know it. We have and in this in science there is so much we don't know and to to deal with not knowing is a hard thing for us in this uh, in this age we know we know everything but we know so little and there are many indices well many points that could lead to the question that plants feel pain same hormones but we don't have a whole chain of indices so it's as speculative to say they feel pain as the contrary. We just don't know. And I don't think we will ever know if plants feel injustice or not. And I'm very careful to, to keep, we shouldn't humanize plants too much. That's a big danger. They are so completely different from us. And it's nearly not possible to, to think into a plant not having brains or not having nerves. They have different ways of acting like that. But yeah, we should be careful not to humanize. Great. We have uh, uh, one more uh, clarification from Manuel that was in, in regard to artificial intelligence. The question was more about how one could grant rights and dignity to artificial intelligences uh -huh. okay. or if one should do so. I don't know. <laughs> there I have no questions. My, uh, I, I don't know very much about artificial intelligence. I know it's a big question going on, but my issue is plants and living beings. And up to now, I still think plants and living beings are much more than artificial intelligence and have a, a, have a dignity, meaning having an own self and being active. An own self, we can't... Um, well, we can't, we can't get near to it, but we can't explain it totally. Sorry, I couldn't answer this question. Um, um, okay, what, what, are, what are the criteria to define life and own self uh, that you used? That, that's what he asked. What are the criteria to define life and own self? Um, it's complex. I mean, the, the life in plants is evident, right? Um, Your own self is not evident. That's what we had big discussions in the ethics committee. Some thought plants do not have own interests. Some, uh, the, uh, there are different philosophical standpoints. I don't know if I get them in English. The theocentrism means um, God gives every living being uh, an own self. And uh, pathocentrism me means um, that you can talk of an own self if a plant or living being has own interests, that, an own, or that has own interests and can, can experience if something is bad or good for her or him or it can experience, for example, for us, it's pain or lust. And if plants can do that or not, we just don't know. But there are, there are some points that they could and we should, we should deal as if they could, but we will not know and we don't know. Perhaps that's not the whole answer, but as far as I know. Um, it's interesting, perhaps, uh, uh, thank you, Manuel says, thank you, Manuel. Um, it's interesting, uh, I, I would, uh, uh, um, maybe I would ask uh, uh, one more question, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, which in fact uh, has, has two parts. Um, I, uh, 
it is interesting that some uh, similar movements in the directions of uh, rights of, uh, to say, so non-human entities, for instance, rivers, uh, have been uh, fought yeah. uh, in the in the context of, uh, let's say, indigenous cosmologies. For instance, the first example was New Bolivia. Zealand, and there was exactly Bolivia. And yeah. so there are three now over the world. So, so it appears that in a, in a, um, uh, let's say indigenous um, cultures, we have uh, belief systems or, or experiences that, that come close to, 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 the, to the ideas that are now being uh, explored by science that, um, um, that, that basically um, um, even speak of, of kind of sentience in, uh, in the uh, yeah. plant world and so on. Uh, the question is perhaps whether, whether, how do you see it and whether, whether there is a kind of a interesting, interesting dialogue to be, to be opened or, or, or some kind of a listening channel or a discussion channel. I mean, sure. this is... But uh, I remember I had a discussion with uh, uh, women from Peru and India, they were all at the conference. I talked about dignity of plants and the right of plants. And they said, well, for us, this seems totally strange and not right. By giving plants dignity, you set them apart from us and make them to something apart from us, something special. But in our belief, everything is together and you can't just take out a puzzle and put it apart. And I had to say, well, we come the other way around. For us, plants are out there and we are there and we have to give them dignity and rights to get to this whole feeling that everything is together. And that was interesting for me. And yeah, I think my main thing is um, knowing that plants are not soulless machines, uh, that we never will be able to, to explain them scientifically. It also, we can get near, it also means that there are different pathways of getting to knowledge of plants. I talked with people who were along with shamans, who knew more about plants than everybody else. And they said, uh, uh, that's not from my parents, it's from the plants, this knowledge I get. I know from, plant, from people with a, we say with a green thumb, do you say that in English too? Well, from uh, farmers who have the uh, breeders pick uh, the breeders, they can tell a plant this will good, be a good parent for my potatoes. For me, it's drawing that I can approach plants the most intimately. Um, yeah, so uh, what I want to say, uh, natural science is one way to get knowledge, but not all, and there are different pathways to get the, to this knowledge. And indigenous knowledge is, of course, very important. It's also the, it, we do it scientifically by making a big distance between us and the research object, by dissecting it with, and looking at it. And indigenous knowledge is more by in, intuition, letting the, the plant come near, trying to, to um, cut down the brain and get also and get to it uh, defocus perhaps if this is the right defocus and get to another relationship and there are different pathways and it's not one wrong and the other not it's different pathways knowing that natural science has a board has limits um, I would ask you one more question. I think this is this is uh, uh, fascinating what you're explaining. So the question is, um, if uh, if si science is is already on, on these sort of frontiers that are uh, much more radical and exciting and uh, ethically somehow, uh, I I think promising that that gives us a kind of horizon that is much more poetic and exciting. Mm -hmm you know, a kind of a, a 
it, it, it paints a kind of a world that is more beautiful, I think, than the one we, we live in, right? So, yeah. so how do we, how do we uh, in a way, re re-enchant ourselves in the everyday life? Not everybody is a scientist. How do we spread this knowledge around, you know? Because how will people experience the forest in the same way as you do, unless they have that, they that read knowledge? They read my books. They read your books. Okay, so no, so no, no, <laughs> no, no. I I understand, no but it's it's it, it, the question of kind of spreading the message, right? And 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 uh, having those conversations. Yes, and uh, the my aim is to tell stories in the books to look what a plant can do, and I think that could also be your message. And my message to you would really be that dignity is great and rights it's great but that you really try to understand and there were for some beautiful drawings about that that plants are always whole micro ecosystems where you too are included yeah and and try to overcome this uh, blind blindness yeah that's great. more i can Great, we have uh, Vesna with the question. Please uh, come forward. Oh. I just want to. Okay. microphone that where All you right. need to be heard. Okay, right, right there. Sorry. Take this off uh, yeah, Sure. Um, sorry, I just wanted to maybe uh, come, come round to these. Um, let's say these, these political events with the ethics commission and with this group later that you formed in Rheinau. Um, I, I was really interested how that, it's been 10 years now so in a way, how that um, has been received, you know, how was how that published and received and what is the current, let's say reaction to it in Switzerland with this idea. I mean, last summer we had these two very disappointing votes, no, about yes. water and pesticides. And I want you to maybe maybe bring that maybe bring that story to an end up until today. You know what happened with these theses, and what is the interest? Well, it's it's uh, as I said, it's it, I always have to look at it's a guidepost and dignity. Also, it's a guidepost, and I think it's up to us all. And I don't know if we are any further. I think we are. Like when we did these uh, discussions, there were not this movement about urban gardening, about Solavi, Solidarische Landwirtschaft, about uh, uh, gardens on the roofs, about uh, vertical gardenings, about bringing trees, hopefully bringing nature into the towns, about what you're doing. I, I didn't receive that some 10 or 20 years ago. I think people are, many people are slowly recognizing or having a feeling that that plants or nature is important. Don't you? Yes, and very much. We're, we're, we're trying also to be part of this uh, yeah. uh, discussion at least. And yeah, I mean, I think it is reflecting. Uh, yeah, I think it is starting to reflect in policy, if not, let's say, on this um, federal and these, uh, let's say, bigger political discussions that have to do with a lot of interests of a lot of various different people and land uses and, and properties and so on. But I think in in terms of uh, Raum planning or regional planning and, and city planning, I think certain principles are starting to become integrated if still viewed from, let's say, this functional ecosystem yeah. services, functional, with the word uh, I was looking for, functional yeah. viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I, but I think it's a maybe it's a start towards mm -hmm. because I think that the kind of knowledge that entails ec ecology is 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 really a very different kind of thinking in the end. And it would have different implications in planning. But then then let's say the, um, the current way it's being done. But I think it's very slow to get yeah, to get everybody to a certain level of, of even knowledge in order to be able to yeah. create policies and planning instruments that that are, let's say, uh, yeah, proper to to let's say ecosystems or to proper to not only social systems, let's say. Yeah, 
Great, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I mean, uh, what is uh, there is one uh, one uh, kind of a frightening, uh, frightening. I mean, uh, uh, issue. So, so the the fact that you admit that science doesn't know a lot of things about plants and may never <laughs> never know them, and I think that this uh, kind of a, assumption of a lot of systems in which we operate, let's say, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, urban uh, planning uh, or or design, is you know, based on a kind of a really uh, uh, idea that this uh, knowledge is, is very complete and very solid and so on, right? So this sort of a, a, some, some kind of a mo modesty of, uh, about the degree of knowledge would, would help, <laughs> let's say, uh, in, in approaching. The most important, in German, it's uh, Erkenntnis theoretische Grenzen, limits of, of of no, well, <laughs> simple, <laughs> but but it's a, a important also philosophical question mm -hmm. that we have to put in our heads again. Yes, that's uh, that's great. I think something something for us to explore in the <laughs> in the future. Let's say in this uh, lecture series, I think uh, a good task. And uh, now I think with this. Uh, um, after this conversation, uh, uh, and especially uh, linking to to a couple of messages you 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 already delivered us, and I think also linking to those uh, beautiful drawings and paintings that you have shown as an illustration of your uh, of your work, um, uh, we will propose a third task to the students or Florian will present the task. Uh, we were excited about it and you, you will tell about it. It, it basically involves the uh, act of painting. What? what? Would you, would you um, we, we are uh, uh, just a moment, we will share the, the slides. And uh, uh, so the, the task, uh, to the students uh, in which uh, uh, they will go to the forest and they will paint uh, uh, a plant, a single plant uh -huh, okay. or, a, or a group group of plants in the way how, how you did it in some of your exercises. So we will ask the students to do that. So this entire, okay. entire let's say, uh, um, class which is large and in total uh, uh, will will have uh, more than more than um, probably 150 or or even 200 students uh, working uh, on this exercise which we which we have titled my forest and uh, i uh, i can um, would you like to read or i can i can read uh, this is a wonderful uh, uh, poem by mary mary oliver that you shared with us, or shall we just leave it on the screen? Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm, I don't know, I'm perhaps, I just love to go into woods. And now with the Corona year, I was, I experienced the spring in as I probably never did before I was every day and I was just drawing painting without I think without no purpose and and then looking what's coming out most of it I threw away but for me important was just to sit in front of these flowers and and um draw, paint them and look what they are doing with me. Look, there is some connection. Yes. And I have an atelier. I go there and try to interpret, but without much purpose. So in the head. Also, I don't go to the woods and think, oh, I have to draw a WWW, like, which means, uh, didn't I say, the wood white web and not the world white web. Uh, just what's coming. <laughs> I can't say very much about that. Great. So, uh, so we will uh, we will give you give you a chance to not uh, uh, 
for once not be intellectual, not be scientific, so work uh, purely based on your experiences and emotions in the forest and please do paint. So uh, use the, the paint, painting techniques, so watercolor, tempera, acrylic, what, what you like. I think colors could be, could be wonderful here instead of a, of a black and white drawing and uh, uh, use uh, uh, a four sheet, let's say uh, roughly, or, or some, don't make it bigger because we, we have to sort of yeah. <laughs> keep them, <laughs> let's say, uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to those experiences. So basically it will be based on your, your walk into the forest and your, your spending time in the forest and maybe contemplating there some of the, some of the uh, messages you have heard today from Florian, and maybe uh, maybe uh, you will you will uh, continue reading uh, reading her book and the texts, and yes. that will that I will. Have four, <laughs> I have some to sell here. <laughs> Great. So let's say let's say uh, uh, probably those uh, those ideas will 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 change your perception, and maybe maybe th those those uh, those forests or those trees will will look different uh, to you. And I think that's what we would like to, to see and to, to share with each other in the last session. So uh, uh, if, um, uh, please let us know if there, are, if there are any more questions at this point. Also in the chat, we can see, okay. I mean, uh, questions related to the exercise, no? Yeah. Uh, until when? Uh, I believe uh, the date is, tell me, Nazi, the first, uh, the first Thursday of December, that's the 2nd of December. So all of your exercises should be delivered latest by then, because then we have one week to go through them and present kind of design the, the final session in which we will show some some of the the works that have um, uh, that that are perhaps the the, the most uh, most wonderful or most interesting uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, semester can i see them too Absolutely, that is the whole point. Yes, okay, and uh, and uh, whichever comments you give us, so you you might uh, give us a few words or a few a few thoughts as you are looking, and we will we will pass those thoughts to the okay, students. But, uh, I don't want to be the the teacher who knows everything better. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, it's uh, in fact I'm, I'm in fact I'm, I'm using a little bit the guest in order that I am not the teacher who knows everything better, you know. <laughs> so, let's see. so it's a bit of a way of, of opening the conversation. Um, okay, uh, we, have a, we have an interesting question in the chat. Uh, Julia, rather than scientific drawing, it should be an artistic work. Uh, I would say absolutely whatever it means to you. I, I don't believe in a kind of a strict line between science and art. I, I'm not sure, Florian, if you if you believe, but uh, uh, I would say, feel free, Julia, to to explore um, a, a kind of artistic perspective and don't be obliged to follow any particular visual canon in this case. Um, Great. I uh, um, I think uh, uh, we are we are uh, at uh, at the moment where um, we are we are good on time. Thank you all for for being here. Uh, thank you everyone in Diona. Thank you um, uh, everyone in Zoom. Thank you to the team, and most of all, thank you Florian for this uh, you. wonderful lecture and for for joining us today and for this uh, tremendous uh, inspiration thank you so much a big applause please i i don't know uh, <laughs> <laughs> <You see that? laughs> 
there are also some little applause in Zoom, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, wishing you a good week and until next time.